But Stephen, these so numbers here suggest... So we need to suggest, invest much more aggressively Stephen, these numbers here into do demographic suggest, change. Okay, Mattis, hang on a sec. The, the numbers do suggest here, Stephen, that, that consumption habits have as much, and we're hearing from Bruce, perhaps more to do in the urgent near-term future with the survival of the planet than whether or not we've got five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half, or ten and a half billion people on this planet. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I think that both of those factors are, are extremely important. I think, you know, in the rich countries, yes, we have to reduce our hyperconsumption. That means dramatic reductions in, in production of greenhouse gases and in our use of other resources. Absolutely, that has to happen. That has to be a top priority. But we also have to start figuring out how we can, you know, reduce the rate of population growth around the world. It's, 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 there's a very, very simple equation to describe it. I mean, we have to work on both of these things. Um, the, the, you know, the, the greenhouse gas issue, the climate change issue is, is the paramount issue that we're going to have to tackle, but we have to deal with the population thing as well. And I certainly agree with Bruce, is that I mean, when you talk about you know, stabilizing population, whatever, people think, okay, we're talking about China with the one-child policy, et cetera. And certainly we wouldn't, we wouldn't advocate anything like that. The key to it, as I think as Bruce has suggested, really is to empower women. Where you have women who are educated, birth rates come down. That's the key. Whenever that's happened, the birth rates have come down. So Can I just check something here, Stephen? On. Let me just check something. Is there anybody on the program today, any of our five guests, who believe that implementing a one-child policy, as was done in China, is the way to go? Well, I don't think it, morally okay. it's not the way to do, go and it's not possible. It's been very successful. But the fact of the matter is that consumption rates in China are going up faster than population rates. So it still hasn't solved the problem even in a Chinese context. I, you know, I agree with the point that the only real effective uh, population control policy is, in fact, is not just educating women, it's urbanizing women. And the, the figures show that when women are in cities, their population rate goes down. But the problem with that is people in cities consume more as well. So there's no easy way to solve a population growth problem. It's not that we shouldn't do family planning and these kinds of things, but there's no way it's going to allow us to deal with the urgent issues we have to deal with in the I next 10 years. I think if family planning were made I'm, available... I'm Hang on, start, this Madeline, start that yeah. again. I said, I think if family planning were made available, if people actually made a serious effort to make family planning available, the population rate would go down because there's about 300 million couples in the world anyway, and that doesn't even include, you know, the unmarried people and whatnot who would use family planning if it, if it were available. And so after the Cairo conference, which was supposed to be this great big thing in 1994, in many ways was actually a disaster because it relegated to the backseat any direct addressing of the issue of population control and, in fact, made population control a dirty word. Now, we don't, I mean, in a Democrat, in a, let's, we were talking about China earlier mm -hmm. and um, the, the, you talked about the one-child policy that yes. they enforced. That would not be enforceable in a democratic country, I don't believe. But if you look at the impact that it's had on China, the government believes it averted 400 million births. Now, as it is, um, China's, China's environmental situation is pretty disastrous. And the fact that they did avert 400 million births, as far as the environment is concerned, it benefited. You think that was a good thing? All right, Mattis, I think I heard you trying to get in. I think there are many good news stories, and we don't even have to talk about draconian measures. On the contrary, Thailand, for example, had uh, social entrepreneurs made uh, family planning just available outside of the medical profession, so women would have the choice to use it, or families would have to, 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 uh, the choice to use it, and there the growth rate of the population grew, uh, dropped from 3% a year to now 0.5% a year. Well, I think uh, what Math is plenty on, on voluntary measures. I think you just resupported my point but by, when I said that, you know, where they should work hard to make family planning methods readily available. Compare Thailand with the Philippines. Absolutely. About 30 years ago, they had about the same population and the same rate of growth. And now mm -hmm. Thailand has a stable population and is much better off economically, while the Philippines population increased by about 30 million in the last 20 years. And they're mm -hmm. having, uh, uh, Thailand exports rice and the Philippines imports rice. Let me put this notion on the table here. Nicholas Eberstadt from the American Enterprise Institute has written a lot about this. And here's an excerpt from something he wrote online a few years ago. Between 1900 and 2000, he says, the human lifespan likely doubled. This radical drop in mortality is entirely responsible for the increase in human numbers over the course of the 20th century. A healthier population is clearly going to be a population with greater productive potential. 
Healthier people are able to learn better, work harder, and engage in gainful employment longer than unhealthy, shorter-lived counterparts. Uh, Bruce raises the question, does all this talk about lowering the birth rate actually miss the point about how we got population growth on this planet? No, I, you know, they, they go hand in hand. The birth rate increasing, um, obviously, uh, will increase the, the size of the global population. But, you know, we, we want people to live longer. We want people to live healthier. And uh, that comes with uh, increased health care, uh, eliminating poverty. Um, these are all, uh, you know, good things. Um, but what, where I think we have the real opportunity is in lowering that birth rate. And we have, in fact, from 1950 to present day, we've cut the fertility rate in half globally. Mm -hmm. And we will take it down to just a little over 2% um, in, by 2050. Uh, at the same time, though, you know, the problem, as Madeline points out, in, in China, uh, I don't think so much is the, the population. Obviously, the population impacts. But it's the fact that they all want to own a mid-sized car, which is a reasonable part of the American dream. But if we all f fulfill that dream or you know, go after that dream, we're going to need three more planets in order and to fulfill it. It's much easier to get people to cut back on the number of their children than on their consumption. So why don't we focus on making everything available to help people cut back on the number of their children? And, and as for the, the, the point of the article that you mentioned, Steve, yes, we have increased our style of living at the expense of what? I mean, we've taken over one-third of the land surface. We have depleted the oceans. All of the major fisheries are being fished at or, at or beyond capacity, and in 30 years, at current rates, they'll all collapse, like the cod fishery. There's about 200 dead zones in the ocean. We've totally decreased biodiversity. About a quarter <coughs> of all land animals and plants are going to be threatened with extinction by 2050. Well, I think no one is here to defend that, obviously. However, let me, let me put a line of logic out here, and Jeb, maybe I'll get you to respond to this. If population growth is due to, as Nick Eberstadt said, improvements in health, and if those improvements in health have led to more economic growth, uh, the spread of wealth, people feeling better about their lives, is that a trend you really want to stop? Well, you know, I, I think the, the issue is here is we can't, we can't stop it. I mean, we can't morally stop it. Um, the bigger trend that hasn't really been put on the table here is, is uh, the massive reorganization of societies into urban societies, and that's going to carry on for another 20 or 30 years. So I actually think what we need to deal with is managing that shifting of people to cities and developing our cities in a way that we can get these consumption efficiencies they, they actually exceed what we can do by reducing population. Let me give you an example of the bad side of it. Rio de Janeiro, in just four years between 1994 and 1997, had a level population. Its waste volumes increased 30% in that period of time. Hmm. Okay, so what we see is, is that in, an urban, in a real world urban context, is, is that consumption is far outpacing in terms of impact population increase. In East Asia, where the Thai population control program was a success, where China is a success, East Asian consumption up 6.1%. Uh, in the same time as industrialized countries, it's increasing at 2.3% a year. So it's this consumption factors that's important. And a critical figure for us when we think about greenhouse gases is what happens when we concentrate people in cities. They did a study on the Chicago metropolitan area in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. Inner city Chicagoans uh, uh, emit one-fifth of the CO2 emissions of those who live in the rural regions on the suburbs. So there's a massive gain to be had by increasing people's um, health in movement to cities. Women get educated in cities. Their population size goes down. So it's a win-win on that point of view. And you can also get these ecological gains by, by doing that.